Um, also going to share my screen um, so that you can see this important slide that has information that is very relevant to you all. Um, so let's just, there we go, and we are good to go. Um, Sadia, I will now pass on to you. Thank you, Maria, uh, for that introduction. And uh, Sadiq Goman, thank you to all of you and hello. And thank you again for joining us. Um, like Maria said, I'm Sadia, I'm one of the program managers. Um, I'll spend a few minutes today talking to you about a bit about the foundation and like a really brief intro into our scholarships program before I hand over to my colleague, um, Zane, who can give us more details. So some of you may already know the Aziz Foundation has been around for about six years now. We were set up in 2015 um, by the Aziz family. We started off life as quite a traditional grant making foundation. Um, uh, since about 2018, um, we have expanded our, our scholarships program, which always existed, but it was you know a lot smaller than what it is now. We've expanded our scholarships program and uh, you know, simultaneously rolled back our, our grants program. So you know, we find ourselves in this great situation now where I think since 2018, we've awarded more than 400 scholarships. Um, and this year for academic year 2022, 23, we're looking to award another 100 scholarships. Um, I know it's, it's a question that people often wonder about, like how is the foundation funded? So I just wanna say a sentence or two on that. Um, we're, we're funded by the Aziz family, we're funded by their companies, the profits from their companies. Um, those companies mainly uh, manage uh, like residential or commercial properties around London, including some hotels. Um, so uh, we're, we're funded primarily from the profits uh, from that. Our scholarships programme, as you know, um, it will start accepting applications in January. Um, and you know, when, when I said we're looking to award around 100 scholarships. So the main criteria for these scholarships you may have already seen on our website is that they're open, um, they're open to British Muslims, they're open to those who qualify for home fees status uh, in this country, and they are for master's uh, degrees only. So unfortunately, it doesn't include things like, uh, like PhDs. What it does include um, so it doesn't include things like PhDs, but also things like GDL, the LPC course, uh, PGCE course. But what it does include um, is all master's degrees such as an MRes, MPhil, MA, MSc, of course. So those are, those are the types of degrees that are included. Um, in terms of the kind of person that we are looking for, I think Zane may cover a bit more of this. But what I will say is that um, we're looking for kind of, you know the people who. Um, who have aspirations to facilitate kind of better representation of Muslims and contribution of Muslims to, to civil society in this country, um, you know, and, and make contributions to industries in which Muslims are underrepresented um, in the UK and to use this representation to combat Islamophobia, combat kind of negative perceptions about Islam, negative perceptions about Muslims. Um, also, we want to see um, applications from people who have asp aspirations or, you know, already doing work to kind of better conditions in Muslim communities or better standards in Muslim communities. So that's the kind of um, the person that we're looking for. Um, since last year, our, our scholarships program has undergone two main changes. Um, the first of those changes is that we now only award scholarships for study at one of our partner universities. There are currently 18 of uh, 18 such universities. My colleague Zane will talk a bit more about this um, in his section, uh, which is coming right up. Um, the other main change that our scholarships program has undergone is that we now only award scholarships in um, in courses that fall into one of our priority areas. Currently, there are uh, there are six priority areas. So from last year, obviously, we had law, we had media, which um, you know especially includes journalism, um, and we had policy. Uh, to that, this year we are adding tech, we are adding sustainability, and the last one that we are adding is creative content. Um, the reason we have chosen those areas um, are because there there is clearly an underrepresentation in Mus of Muslims. Um, in most of those areas, if not all of those areas, and we know that they um, they impact all of our lives. 
for example, if we look at the media, you know, Muslim communities are talked about a lot. Um, and there really rarely ever is kind of contribution from Muslims about the narratives that are produced about us in the media. So it's that's something that we're really keen to uh, positively transform. Similarly, policies, you know, we, we see policies all the time that impact Muslims, but rarely ever contribution from Muslims to ensure that, you know, such policies aren't harmful, but, you know, and, if, uh, and are instead like kind of beneficial to us or at least sensitive to Muslims' needs. Um, you know, sustainability is, is incredibly topical, it's incredibly important. We know that the state of our planet um, is, is worrisome and it's, you know, it's deteriorating all the time. So we really want to see Muslims at the forefront, um, you know, in the fight to save our planet. Um, tech, again, it's a growing area um, and we know there is talent in Muslim communities when it comes to things like tech. And we want to facilitate, um, you know, facilitate that talent and, you know, ensure that they, they realise their potential, their, you know, their they're kind of there, you know, offering the, you know, the newest solutions, the most efficient solutions to um, society's most pressing problems. Uh, creative content, um, again, that's around, you know, looking at the means by which narratives are produced, whether it be in on, you know, on theatre stages, in television, on films, you know, in, in films, we want to see a higher representation of Muslims there. Um, and people, you know, in rooms who feel confident enough to be able to say, actually, that's offensive, we shouldn't be doing that, you know, or actually, that's really inaccurate, you know, we, there's a better way we can do this. So that's the kind of talent we want to facilitate and bring and bring to the front. Um, all of these six areas are listed on our website um, and, you know, the website also provides details on on what what kind of courses or, you know, what kind of areas it covers, what kind of aspirations we are looking for in people. So I would really encourage all of you to visit that or to visit the website, you know, and read through the relevant pages. Um, I think that's all that's all there is for me to say. I'm going to hand over to Zane now, um, you know, to cover his sections of, of, uh, of today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sadia. And as Sadia said, my name is Zain. I'm program manager at the Aziz Foundation. I'm going to say a few words just on our preferred partner universities. So just please bear with me. As you will see um, on your screen, on the right hand side, we have eight preferred partners, 18 preferred partners. Apologies. Um, we only award our scholarships through these um, partners. You also see at the bottom of your screen that we have two institutional partners. So let me just explain a bit about the conceptual and the administrative distinction between these two separate schemes. Um, so if we take a look at the institutional um, partnerships, these are completely administered by the universities themselves. And we feed in at the, um, at the award stage and obviously before that um, at the interview stage, so at the shortlisting stage. If you, want to, um, if you want to try and apply for these schemes, you have to apply directly to the universities themselves. Um, if we look at our preferred partners, this is where we operate a parallel processes system. And what that means is you'd have to apply to us for the scholarship and separately you'll have to apply um, to the university to gain admittance onto um, <coughs> the scheme. And you can, um, in that process, you can apply in whichever order um, you wish. So you might want to apply to the university first and then apply to the scholarship or, or vice versa, or, e or even simultaneously. Um, I just want to draw your attention to a few technicalities when it comes to our preferred partners. So you will see at City University, our agreement with the university only covers the courses, um, the course provision within the journalism uh, department. So it's for those courses only. And at Coventry, um, our courses or our eligible courses are limited to the Centre for Trust, Peace and Social Relations. Um, only. So just bear that in mind when you're applying to these uh, preferred partners. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is that with the University of Sheffield, um, that agreement only covers selected courses, and that's the same with London South Bank University. So only selected um, courses are covered um, there. So please bear that in mind. Um, other than that, I'll just say in very much in general terms, these are all fantastic universities. We're working with them to create an inclusive learning environment for British Muslim students. So these are Muslim friendly institutions and we'd encourage you to apply to them. Um, in terms of the list itself, it's not definitive. Um, negotiations and discussions are ongoing with prospective partners, 
So we'd expect this list to be subject to change to expand over the coming months. And that includes during the course of the application cycle. So as they're active, you know, expect to see a few more partners um, join this scheme. If your preferred institution is not in this list, what I'd suggest you do is contact the university. You may want to contact uh, the widening participation team, the admissions or recruitment team, or, or perhaps even the philanthropy office, and just let them know um, why these scholarships are so important for you um, and the difference these scholarships can make to the lives of uh, British Muslim um, students on campus. Um, I'm just going to move on now to uh, what makes a good application. Um, and I want to point out um, that we have some guidance. There's a guidance document on this on our website. So before you make your application, please do read it um, and uh, give it some give it some thought. Um, I am going to confine what I'm about to say just to the vision or the personal statement element of the um, application. Um, I think the first thing to say is that um, as you go through your application, you will see that there's an 1,000 word limit um, when you come to the personal statement. And we'd recommend that you use all your 1,000 words um, and give as much detail as possible. However, I'd also point out that this isn't an invitation to, to waffle. Make sure all your points are substantive. Um, and I, what I suggest you do is always refer back um, to the thematic criteria um, that Sadia um, mentioned. Um, also, please get your work proofread before you submit it. Um, you may wish to draft in a, um, a sibling, a parent, perhaps your friends, um, but of course you don't have that critical distance with your work, you're just too close to it. So um, it is good to get someone else to, to look at it and um, just because, I mean, we do look at punctuation and grammar um, when we assess the personal statements um, and obviously that gives an indication of how much effort um, you put um, into crafting it. Um, if we just look at the content of the personal statement, um, I think the best thing to do is just to start with a general statement. And the general statement is in that personal statement, you will have to demonstrate um, how your selected course um, and the aspirations it will help realise also benefit uh, British Muslim communities. So if we were just to unpack that slightly, um, I just want to first start by saying um, that the, your selected course, it has to align with your career visions. So in other words, there shouldn't be any mismatch between the course that you've selected and your long-term career plans and, and ambitions. So to give you an example, if you were a budding journalist and you've selected a journalism course, it would be really odd in the personal statement if you mentioned um, that you're really interested in law um, and you know lots of barristers, so on and so forth. I know that's a very crude and rough and ready example. Um, and you know, per writing personal statements can be quite complex, particularly when intuitively, um, or at least from first reading, your subject might not align with your career aspirations. But if that is the case, you will have to produce a compelling argument to demonstrate to us that actually there is a there is a close alignment there. And secondly, um, of course, um, in when you realise the aspirations, this will have to benefit um, British Muslim communities. Um, and what we'd really look for is for you to say perhaps um, that you engage with you've engaged with British Muslim community organisations or civil society organisations. But if you haven't got that engagement, you might want to focus your personal statement on how you will make a, a big social impact within um, wider society or civil society, more generally speaking. Um, and that might include you saying something along <coughs> the lines of, well, you know, I'm going to have access to spaces where British Muslims are traditionally underrepresented. Um, and that's where uh, you're going to make an impact through changing um, social um, attitudes and combating um, Islamophobia. Um, as Sadia pointed out, and I'll just emphasise, uh, you will notice that we're speaking a lot about British Muslim communities. So your impact will have to be in the UK. You may wish to, in your personal statement, mention the fact that you've worked with British, sorry, with uh, Muslim communities um, overseas, and that's fantastic. Um, but that has to be incidental 
to uh, your main aspirations, which have to be focused um, on the UK um, community. Um, lastly, I mean, I'll just say very briefly that while we welcome um, discourse of your um, aspirations within the personal statement, um, your, your vision statement should not be purely aspirational. So please do reference your personal work experience, um, perhaps any voluntary work, extracurricular activities. And if you're an undergraduate student and you've not started work, you may wish to consider uh, mentioning <coughs> um, a lot of the activities that you participated in, perhaps with your local Islamic society or student societies, with the students' union perhaps, perhaps you've led a campaign, or, um, or maybe you've, you've um, participated in uh, widening participation or access schemes. We want to hear all of that, so please include that uh, within the confines of your, of your statement. Um, I'm going to leave it there, except for the fact that I just remembered Maria said to me, I also have to mention the, um, the application cycles, which I shall endeavour to do right now. Um, OK, so it's important to note that the first application cycle starts on the 11th of January and ends on the 31st of March. Um, and the second application cycle starts on the 1st of April and uh, concludes on the 11th of uh, July. The two application cycles are aligned to um, different awarding rounds. Um, so the first application cycle, um, the um, announcement of the awards um, is in May and for the second cycle, um, that is in August. So if your uh, course starts in September, October or January of the following year, um, you may um, apply in either cycle. However, if your um, course starts before September, please apply in the first cycle. Okay, well, thank you ever so much for listening to me. I'm going to hand back now to, to Maria. Thank you ever so much for that, Bain. Um, so now is the portion that everyone's been waiting for, um, your chance to ask all of your questions. Um, the burning, the less burning, um, anything that comes to mind. Um, if you'd like, you can drop them in the chat side function now. Um, I'm also going to grab the link for our YouTube channel so you know where to find the recording. Um, or you can use the raise hand function and um, I can just come to you and we can do it that way instead. So let's have a look. This is going to be a bit tricky to see, you, but all good. Is there any opposite agent for the candidates? We'll get some questions in the chat box, I think. Okay, so um, there is not an official upper age limit. Um, so, you know, people from all different backgrounds, all um, ages, all different like walks of life, different points at your career um, can apply whether you're fresh out of your undergrad or whether you are, um, whether you are kind of taking a career break, you can, um, you can apply and you can feel free to do that. Um, oh, more questions in. I'm conscious that you guys have not had a chance to hear Aftab's um, lovely voice, so I'm going to let him um, take over and answer the question. I'll just read them out um, and then Aftab can answer them. Um, so a question from Widuri is, is, are there any scholarships for architecture apart from the Bartlett? Um, so, I, so I'll, I'll answer this. Um, after I can answer the next question, um, I, I just want to point out that in the for the Bartlett scheme, um, which I help administer, um, actually uh, architecture courses are not eligible because they don't fit into our um, policy subject area. So, in fact, we don't award any scholarships for architecture. Um, a lot of the, um, um, I suppose, courses that the uh, Bartlett offer that are eligible would be around um, heritage. Um, they'll be around um, basically policy-based questions that look at the socio uh, socioeconomics of um, planning, um, <coughs> of architecture, um, so on and, and, and so forth. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much for that, Zane. 
Um, I know there were some questions just at the top of the chat box. Uh, somebody's asking if it's compulsory to be a British citizen to be eligible for the home. <coughs> you do have to be a British citizen, but what you do uh, have to qualify for is the home fees status. And I think the simplest way of checking your eligibility uh, on that um, aspect is to check with the university. Um, they will be able to advise whether they will consider you for home fees or not. Um, yep, and I think there was another question, can you still get a scholarship if you have no student debt but fulfill all the criteria? Um, yeah, so in our assessments there is a there is a means testing part of it as well, but the short answer to your question is that yes, you, you can still be considered for a scholarship, you can still receive a scholarship if you don't have student debt. Um, okay, Tahmina has a question, would you like to unmute yourself? Tahmina, can you hear me? Um, OK, we'll wait for Tahmina to come back to us. But um, Majida, you also have a question, I think. You have your hand raised. Do you want to unmute? Hi, Sonikum. Thank you so much for this. This is really helpful. Um, I'm so sorry if you've answered this already. I had like funny Wi-Fi connection, so it's going in and out. Um, but say if you want to study a master's, that's not technically in the policy in the four areas that you're um, talking about, but within that there are modules. Um, so I'll just give you an example. I'm looking at a master's at SOAS, which is religion in global politics. Um, and it's a really like varied course. It's got modules in media, in, in law, um, partly literature, partly religion, partly politics. Um, and I'd like to go into writing and research. So I'd like to work in media. Would I still qualify for the scholarship or is it that the actual degree course that you're studying has to be in journalism or media and whatnot? Thank you. Thanks, Majida. That's a really good question. Um, yes, yeah, so I think we would we would definitely consider an application for the course that you're referring to. And um, what I would say is, or what I would advise is that in your personal statement, I think it would be important for you to lay out your aspirations and demonstrate how they meet the criteria for uh, for the kind of person that we're looking for. So, for example, you're saying that you'd like to work in the media. So, so long as your personal statement addresses that, um, it should be fine. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think there are some more questions. Uh, we're struggling, to be honest with you, to keep up with the chat box. Um, so, our financial, financial we, we already answered about financial circumstances. There is a means testing element. So, you know, we will look at levels of student loan. We will look at levels of household income. Um, you mentioned that you don't give a scholarship for the GDL, but University of Law offer a GDL with a master's. So, does that qualify for a scholarship? So, uh, I'm not sure which specifically you're referring to but for example we know that they there is an LPC with the master's so LPC with LLM and we consider applications for that so again if this is a GDL with the LLM uh, part added to it yes we would consider an application for that you may want to email the course um, with a link to the course uh, exact course that you're talking about and then we can give you a more definitive answer um, Masna you've asked about um, Part-time masters, yes, we consider uh, we consider applications for part-time, full-time, uh, long-distance learning as well. And then there's a question from Sirazul: um, What are the criteria for awarding the scholarship? Um, so I mentioned some of the criteria. My my colleague Zain mentioned the criteria, but I think if you missed the first part of this webinar, I'd advise that you visit our website because the criteria is detailed there. Um, and then Najum is asking about wanting to go to BPP. Saying I'll let you answer that question. Somebody's asking about whether we're likely to have a partnership with, with BPP. Well, um, <coughs> so just in relation to a prospective partnership with BPP, um, it is a university I've been in contact with um, and I even met with, um, I think, a manager of wine participation at the university perhaps about six months ago now. Um, I get the impression there's no appetite for this partnership on the side of BPP, but I might be wrong, only because they've not really um, responded to any of my communications um, over the last few months or so. I think in, in general terms, what I would say is that it's important for uh, universe, uh, for, sorry, for applicants that want to go to BPP to actually contact the university um, and really convey the fact that these scholarships mean a lot to you 
um, and um, BBP are missing out by not having the vision of these scholarships uh, for British Muslim students. Um, so I think that's pretty much all I can really say on, on the matter. I think that's a, I think lots of universities are in the same boat as BPP, which is um, I've had negotiations with them, uh, we've had correspondence, uh, but not much has happened by way of establishing the partnership. Um, so let, let's hope things change within the next few months. I think um, usually when the application cycle is active, there's more impetus um, for universities to join because they see that we're um, we're um, awarding scholarships. Um, so yeah, well, let, let's let's hope that BPP, um, you know, they get back in contact with us um, and that we can establish a partnership. But um, yeah, I, I can't say more than that, unfortunately. I'll take that. Yeah. Um, Faisal, you've asked, are those who already have a master's, uh, are they eligible? Yes, they are eligible. Uh, we Every year we do get a small number of people who already have a master's degree um, applying, but obviously, you know, there, there might be kind of a slightly, a slightly higher threshold that they need to demonstrate for why they need another master's. Um, Anam's asked about an MA in International Development and Education. Um, if it would only really be covered if you can demonstrate how uh, that course would help you make a difference in educational policy in this country. Um, if I'm honest, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't appear to be like, you know, straightforward. That demonstration would be straightforward because it is international development, um, you know, which is probably deems itself to more kind of work internationally, which is not so much of what we're interested in. Um, what exactly does a scholarship cover? It covers tuition fees only. Um, so, yeah, so all our scholarships are for tuition fees only, not, not for maintenance costs. I already answered the question about part time. Yes, it can be part time. It can be long distance learning as well. Um, is there a scholarship for PhD students? We used to have scholarships for PhD students, but unfortunately not anymore. For anybody looking for a PhD uh, scholarship, we'd advise that they approach the university they're interested in studying at because they'll have a list of, of eligible scholarships. Can, can I just um, add up to what Sadi said um, and say for applicants that want to apply for the Bartlett <coughs> Promise, um, that scholarship uh, scheme not only includes uh, covering the tuition fees but also living stipend up to £15,000. Um, so AB asks, so salam, alaykum salam. Um, the policy aspect makes sense, but why is health policy um, exempt? We get this question a lot. Um, so Sadia, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so it, it is exempt because I think in, it, when we had our kind of wider policy, uh, so wider scholarships program where we were awarding scholarships of any subjects, um, we awarded kind of quite a lot in that area. Proportionally, they were higher in the health area. Um, so our board wanted to focus, uh, you know, away from areas that you know already had a higher level of funding. Also, we found that there was more funding, kind of like state funding available, you know, or other other means of funding available um, for people in the health sector, um, and it's less so the case for other areas, which is why health policy is excluded. Thank you so much, Sadia, for that answer. Um, can I just remind everyone to please stay muted unless you're um, asking your question. Um, just because it can get a bit hard to hear um, things. Um, so, Sirazal asks, how do you stay connected with scholars after the Masters? Um, I'm going to take this one because that's my job. Um, so, we stay connected um, in a bunch of different ways. If any of you have checked out the YouTube link that I sent, you'll find um, loads of webinars there that we've, um, we've uploaded. Uh, we have these webinars um, monthly, if not twice a month. Um, sometimes where an external speaker will come and they will share their knowledge or share their experience with scholars and scholars will get to interact with them and interact with each other. Um, but we also have a scholar seminar series. Um, we actually have one coming up in just two weeks um, where a scholar will come and they will present about like something that they're interested in and usually it's like their area of research. And um, so we've had some about um, intersectionality in education. We've had somewhere one of our scholars did an internship with the Center for Media Monitoring and she came and presented what she learned. So that's one of the ways where um, that's one of the ways that we keep in contact with scholars um, after they do their masters. Um, another way is that we have this um, really large uh, WhatsApp group chat um, and then we have kind of spin-offs um, for like the different um, areas. So we have one for like 
philosophy or law or economics or whatever it may be. And so people can have larger conversations where they connect with each other and the big group chat and then they can have like more subject specific ones. Um, we keep in contact on Slack, regular emails, like the list goes on. So we do definitely stay connected in something that we actually really care about. Um, so Sheikh Ali says, how strict are the area requirements? For example, I'm interested in pursuing a master's in clinical education to impact further educational policies for it to be more representative. Would it be OK to apply? Um, I think, I mean, to be honest with you, I don't know what clinical education is. So uh, what clinical, yeah, a master's in clinical education is, you'd probably have to send an email with a, with a link to that course so we can look into it. Because if it's kind of clinical in the sense of the science clinical, then probably not. But if it's something related to educational policy, you know, in a more traditional sense, um, then yeah, probably. But we would need to look into this course a bit more because I'm afraid I don't recognize the name or, you know, understand what, what it covers. Um, so Adam says, has a few questions. Um, we'll do them one by one. Are there set allocations per use, per, per course, per uni? Yeah, I think, uh, Zane, do you want to take that? Because you lead on our preferred partners. There's no set allocation by um, course, but there is um, set allocations by universities. Um, and that really depends on the university itself. So universities tend to put caps on the number of scholarships that we award. Um, but this is not really relevant for the applicant. And why I say that is because um, if we find that, so for example, for University of Sheffield, we have uh, five scholarships in place in the partnership. But if we find that there's lots of applicants and there's fantastic candidates for the University of Sheffield, we might, for example, award above um, the, the five scholarships. It's really for internal administrative purposes because it's to do with the negotiations and the conditions that are fulfilled on the university side, including the, um, the concessions model they have to um, adhere to. So if I was if I was a and I'm applying <coughs> to um, University A or University B, one of our preferred partners, in other words, I wouldn't worry about the, um, the allocation of, of scholarships per se. Um, thank you so much for that, Zane. Um, Adan also asks, do all of the courses have an equal rating for priority? Um, we'd say yes. Um, so, of course, like we said, we're looking at those six areas. Um, and we, yeah, so they, they're all rated equally for in terms of priorities. Um, can can I just, sorry, Marie, can I just add um, to um, what you just said? Um, I think the question probably has arisen out of the fact that we're saying we're going to be awarding 100 scholarships, but it might be more than 100 scholarships, it could be less than 100 scholarships. It really depends on the nature of the demand, um, uh, how competitive it is this year, and it usually is very uh, competitive um, indeed. So, as I say, I, I wouldn't worry about the allocations, um, particularly from the applicant's perspective. Thank you so much for that. Um, Okay, Amin asks, is a master's degree in digital marketing included? Um, yes, like, it's certainly not excluded. Um, but like I said, for, you know, in, in my response to the other questions, as long as you can demonstrate how, how that meets the criteria, we're happy to consider it. This one, thank you, Sadia. This one is for Zain. So if a university was to begin negotiations about becoming a partner university now, would it be too late for it to be included this year? I am part of the process to get the Race Equality Charter at Lancaster University, and this was mentioned in our last meeting. That's great that it was mentioned. Okay, this question is specifically framed to, to test me, I think. Um, so I think what I'll probably say um, is that any prospective partner can join at any stage during the course of the, of the year. But of course, since our application cycle starts in January, we want as many partners to be on board before the application um, cycle opens, because that means that that would increase the chances of us awarding scholarships to that particular institution. Having said that, because we have two cycles and we understand that if we're having conversations now with um, prospective partners, they might not be able to establish a partnership before January. Um, that's a very quick turnaround time um, and universities are used to long timescales. There is an opportunity for um, those institutions to target um, April, so this second cycle, the start of the second cycle. So there could be a few month period between uh, between um, April and July 
Uh, that's the awarding window where scholarships could be awarded to that institution, that, that new um, preferred um, partner. Um, but beyond that, I mean, if it's not possible for a university um, to join at any stage during um, the period in which the cycle is operational or, or active, then they can join in our off season, which is obviously between um, between um, August and um, and December, and for the for the year following. Thank you so much for that, Zane. Um, so Fatima asks um, about creative content courses. Is comparative literature included? Um, yeah, I believe it is included. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it is included. Um, and again, you know, it's about like demonstrating kind of how your how your aspiration aspirations match with what we're looking for. Yeah. So things like creative content and policy might not be as clear cut as something like law or as something like media. But um, as Sadia mentioned, if you can, like, first of all, send us the course if you think that it's really like a risky choice, and we can we can look into it. We can have a conversation about it. And second of all, if you can show how it's going to help um, in terms of our goals and our aims, which you can find on the website, then you can, like, that's fine. Um, Najim Al Hassan asks, um, do you offer funding for wanting to be a, a barrister? Yes, we do. We um, we cover uh, BPC courses. Um, as long as it's with the LLM. As long as it's with the LLM. BPC with the LLM. Um, so, um, Ibrahim asks, uh, can you get funding for the postgraduate diploma in law conversion? Um, no, unfortunately, we do not fund uh, that law conversion. Um, Zakaria asks, how many scholarships are up for grabs in each area? So there are 100 scholarships available um, for these six areas. Um, in terms of how many are going to be available for each different area, that's just going to depend on demand. Um, you know, if there are like 200 applications for media and like 10 for creative content, then we'd have to look at that proportionately. So it'll really just depend. Um, would an MBA be considered at Imperial Business School? Um, not sure if it falls under six categories. So um, the our partnership with the Imperial Business School is separate to our partnership with the 18 universities. The 18 universities are preferred partners. Imperial Business School is an institutional partner. So that whole kind of application process, that whole category is by itself. Um, and it, and there's a, a completely different way of applying and all of that information is on the website. Um, so yeah, you're right, it doesn't fall under the six categories, but you can still apply. And yes, it is, for, uh, Imperial is solely for the MBA. So um, yes, uh, but like Maria said, you'd have to apply to the university directly. Mm. But if any of you are interested in applying to Imperial, it's not currently a preferred partner. So that's one of the ones where You'd have to send them an email and ask them, you know, can you please join this scheme? Um, in terms of uh, Salam Fatima, Fatima asks, in terms of applications, are master's degrees such as human rights and policy, politics or global politics considered? Um, do you want to take this one? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, it's a pretty straightforward answer. Yes, they're considered. And like I'm going to say to everybody, um, think about how Think about like why you want to do that course and how it meets uh, our objectives. And, and if you can demonstrate that, then yeah, obviously you consider your application. Um, Najam Al-Hassan asks, why don't we offer masters in the science field? So this was kind of touched on earlier. Um, the reason that we don't offer masters uh, scholarships in the science and health fields is that in the, the first couple of years or the first few years where we offered a lot of scholarships, um, they kind of uh, largely went to um, people who are in those fields um, and so we'd like to kind of diversify the people who are getting scholarships. Um, also there are more there's more funding available for like MSCs for those kinds of courses. Um, Nahima, you're very much welcome we're glad to have you here. Um, are you still doing the institutional scholarship with Oxford? No unfortunately we're not currently doing that. However, if this changes, uh, we will let you guys know. We will announce it on our social media, etc. Have it on the website. Um, you're also interested in applying to MSc Public Policy at UCL, which isn't part of the Bartlett Scholarship. Your application would not be considered because UCL is not a preferred partner at the moment. However, as I mentioned with Imperial, um, you can email UCL and you can ask them um, really nicely um, mm -hmm. to be part of our preferred partnership scheme, a preferred partnership program, 
Um, and hopefully, if there are lots of you guys emailing them and saying to them that you want them to be part of the scheme, they will kind of take that on board and they will start the process of joining. Really, I just want to point out that I'm, um, I've had a conversation um, with Michael Collins. He's one of the deputy deans of the School for um, Social and Historical Sciences. Um, and we got a draft uh, proposal from them. So I suspect that the partnership will be established within the next few months, hopefully before the first application cycle. But if not, then certainly before the, the second application cycle um, commences. So that should, for those that are, um, applicants that are looking to apply to courses at UCL, that should give you a bit more a bit more choice if it's if it's a um, course provision that is provided by by that particular department. But I understand it is quite a big faculty. So that should cover quite a, a range of courses. So I hope that reassures you to some extent. Um, thank you so much for that, Zane. Um, so, uh, BB asks, would a Masters of Social Research combined with Social Policy be considered under policy? Um, yep. Sounds like it would be. Yeah. Um, Masna asks, is it possible to apply for a Library Sciences Masters if I'm able to relate it to British Muslims? Or is that too far? Um, honestly, if you're able to relate it and you're able to explain how it fits, um, that is like a conversation that can happen with the ones that aren't entirely clear. That is a conversation that can happen between us and we can get back to you. So if you'd like to send us an email um, and kind of like just link the course that you'd like to apply to, we can have a chat about that and then we can we can get back to you. Um, Emma Griffith is the representative from Warwick University who has joined us today. Hi, Emma. Um, and she says, if Warwick is your preferred university, we have an allocation of up to 12 scholarships. Happy to be contacted if you're considering Warwick for your master's. And she's really kindly put her email address in there. So if any of you are considering Warwick, please note down Emma's um, email address. I'm going to whiz through these now because we've only got a few minutes. Um, Nadim asks, what is the sponsorship criteria for masters? Is it open to certain universities? Do you sponsor PhDs? I think Nadim, I would I would suggest that you visit the website because we've covered all of that. And you know, in the interest of saving time, I, I say you go on the website, it's the yeah. best. Um, also, this is recorded and it'll be up on our YouTube channel. Um, Nadim, I know you joined a bit late, um, but don't worry, all that information has been covered and you will be able to find it um, on the website, as Sadia said, and in this recording. Um, is it possible to present two different courses? Yep, yeah, so with the application form, um, there is definitely space for you to present um, more than one course. We'll obviously ask you for what your priority course is and then, you know, kind of number two and uh, number three, if you like. Um, but if you are if you are presenting more than one course, obviously have a think about kind of how you're going to address your personal statement to both of them. You might want to then make your personal statement a bit broader, um, you know, so it, so it can cover more than one course. Um, exactly. Thank you so and much. So, and, and then uh, I think, I mean, you've asked about is Roehampton a preferred partner? No, it isn't. And again, I'd advise you to go on our website because all of our 18 preferred partners are clearly listed on that. Um, OK, I've just popped in our email address. If you have any more questions, if you feel like anything wasn't answered, um, if you have a specific question about a specific course, um, like we said, like we mentioned, if you kind of it, you're not sure it doesn't it's not, you know, broadcast journalism, which is obviously going to be funded and it's something that's a bit um, confusing, then, yeah, you can let us know and we will endeavour to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, can you get e Emma's email address to you? I will go ahead and find that for you. It um, is in the chat box. If you scroll up uh, to where Emma has messaged, I think I'm not sure, maybe about yeah. 10 minutes ago. Um, she has kindly left her email address there, but I think we'll try and copy and paste it just as this thing, yeah. as this webinar ends. Um, Ad Adan, I think you've asked, is Master of Public Administration relevant to the policy category? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, I think it is. If so, um, sorry, can you start? Um, if so, would it matter if it's just plain MPA or it has another major, for example, international development? I think if you have an international development major, then you make it really difficult for yourself to demonstrate how your impact um, you know, we primarily be focused in the UK. So, but if you kind of, if it's a general MPA, then I think you, you're doing yourself a favour by making it easier for you to demonstrate domestic impact. So, I mean, the choice is yours. If you're interested in international development, then I think the best thing for you to do is find a scholarship that is suitable to that, rather than kind of, you know, twisting it, you know, twisting your personal statement and, you know, and, and thereby reducing the potency of it. Mm. Um, oh, we're 
being joined by a latecomer. Um, so Hussein Sheikh, yes, you can do an MSc in digital marketing. Um, I think we will wrap it up there, um, just because we don't want to um, go over too long. Sorry, this is a bit uh, fast. This is a bit fast. This, this clock. It we've got, yeah, minutes. we've got still got seven, six minutes. I'd say so our laptop, the, the clock's a bit funny, so we thought it was half five. But yeah, you've got another five minutes to, to yeah. get your questions in. Please, if anybody wants to um, ask a question, please don't be shy. Please do raise your hand. Uh, I'd love to hear more people's voices. I'm definitely bored of hearing my own. Um, okay, so luck time is on our on our side for like the first time in any webinar in the history of like since these things started. Um, yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Sorry. Hi, Adam. Yeah, we can yeah, hear Adam, you. Yeah, Adam. Yeah, thanks for your time, and I really appreciate all the inputs and the stuff. Obviously, uh, what Aziz Foundation and partners are doing. Uh, just quickly, I know we're running out of time. Um, aside from the scholarship, um, is there any other way uh, someone can get involved with Aziz Foundation? Please. Um, sure. I mean, it depends on kind of, you know, what kind of involvement you're, you're talking about. But, um, for example, for our scholars and for our alumni, we do um, offer uh, offer mentorship. So we have, uh, we're, we're really fortunate to have, um, like, you know, an amazing bank of volunteers who are, who are mentoring some of our scholars and are mentoring some of our alumni. Um, and we're always, you know, looking for new people to join, uh, join that list of mentors. So if that's something you're interested in, please uh, do email us at the scholarships email address. Uh, we'd love to hear from you on that. And again, like we were saying, for example, if there are universities that you're interested in, but you can see that they're not one of our preferred partners, we always welcome students or prospective students and applicants to write to these universities and, you know, and impress on, upon them the importance of these scholarships. So, um, you know, to help forward our kind of our, our conversations with them and ensure that they do become partners and people can apply there. Um, thank you so much for that, Adam. Thank you, Sadia, for your answer. Um, so Sanjana asks if we still offer the scholarship at Cambridge. Um, and also Fatima asks what kind of things should be mentioned when emailing potential universities to become preferred partners. Zane, do you want to answer both of these questions? OK, so we'll start with the, with the second question. Um, I think the most important thing to mention to the universities is why it's important why the Aziz Foundation scholarships are important, the kind of difference they would make to your life as a British Muslim, and also um, the difference it makes to British Muslim communities more generally. I think for the most part, um, we try and link the scholarships to um, EDI, that's a, that's a quality, uh, diversity and, and inclusion initiatives at the university and also widen the access. And one of the things that we do say is this is a form of widen the access particularly for British Muslim students. And we, we do know um, that British Muslim students are put off um, when it comes to doing master's degrees because of the cost of tuition. And also they're, they're less likely to take out um, the um, postgraduate tuition fee loan as well. So, I mean, I think that's the angle that I'd probably take the EDI slash uh, finding access angle. In, in terms of um, answering the first question on Cambridge and, and Oxford, um, we don't know as of yet whether those schemes are going to continue. We're in the middle, actually, of trying to negotiate a new settlement when it comes to folding those two schemes, which are very much historical um, and wow. have been there since the inception of the foundation in 2016, <coughs> into our preferred partnership scheme. And that does mean um, requiring some concessions from um, those two universities themselves, and it's whether they want to play ball. So we shall have to we shall have to see. Um, I do hope that we can continue those schemes to, um, into the next year, but it might be that Cambridge and Oxford, or perhaps the next year, uh, might not be within the scope of um, our scholarships programme. But yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give you more a better answer than that. We'll just have to wait and see. Thank you so much for that detailed answer, Zane. Um, there is another question in the chat where Faizan asks um, if new Muslims are considered. Um, of course, absolutely, all Muslims are considered, all British Muslims are considered. Um, it's, it's like not something that we like consider. Um, so Majida asks, question for Zane, have you been in contact with Murray Edwards? 
college in Cambridge, I found the college to be really accommodating as an undergrad. Really glad that you did. Um, I'm glad that you had a good experience at Cambridge. Um, yeah, Zane? No, I'm not. Um, we, I mean, we've been in contact with a couple of colleges, both in Oxford and Cambridge, um, but we've not been in contact with that with the specific college that you mentioned. Um, so, I mean, if you'd like to perhaps email scholarships um, at azizfoundation.org.uk with the with the contact, or you'd like to introduce us to someone who can who would perhaps be interested in uh, discussing with us a potential partnership, please do please do e email us so that we can perhaps. Um, look to uh, initiate a conversation around a partnership with them. Thank you so much for that, uh, Majida and Zain. Um, FS Samir asks, is there a scholarship for masters in psychology? Unfortunately, there isn't. Um, last year and the year before, um, sorry, the, the years prior, two years ago and, and the year before that, um, we had a lot of psychology scholars. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we've decided to now focus on these six areas where we feel like Muslims are underrepresented. Um, Adan, don't worry, you can ask more questions if you'd like. Um, we love the questions, keep them coming. Um, but you said, final question, how do you track the scholars' progress? So, funny you ask this, we actually ask for progress reports um, twice uh, a year, and we that's how we kind of like just, you know, keep up with like, how everyone's doing, if they need extra support, if they need, if they feel like they're being accommodated. So progress isn't just like, you know, like if your grades are, if your grades are fine, but also just generally how you're finding the university. Um, if you need a mentor, we can help with that. If you want particular opportunities in like a certain area, an internship, like you're interested in those kinds of things, we can kind of facilitate those things as well. Um, so yeah, we're definitely all about the kind of uh, all-rounded support of scholars um, once they join the cohort of Aziz Foundation scholars. Are there any more questions? Um, okay, Zakari says, Salams, from your experience, what makes an application stand out? Um, I think Zain might have touched on this. Um, I don't know if you want to give like a one-liner for Zakari. Um, I think if you ask us, or if you ask they'd probably say something else. But for me, um, the really the, the most fantastic um, applications that we've had are those British Muslims that are actively using their public platforms to advocate on behalf of their communities, also combat um, Islamophobia. I mean, I think, as I say, um, people can have aspirations to do big things in their life, but those that are already doing it are the ones that are probably most likely to be awarded this scholarship. Um, okay, we will wrap it up there then. Thank you everyone ever so much for joining us and for your questions. Um, the email addresses are in the chat. Um, YouTube link, link to our scholarships page are all in the chat. So if you want to go grab those really quickly. Um, yeah, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your time. We look forward to reading all of your fantastic um, applications and meeting you all as well in the interviews. Um, so that's all from us. Um, if you guys have any last words, Zain and Aftab, speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, I just want to say, obviously, thank everyone for attending the, the webinar and also good luck with the with the applications. And to spread the word, um, tell your friends, tell your parents, um, tell everyone in the community as well who might be interested in applying for this scheme. So can I just say one one little thing I, I should have mentioned earlier um, because it's a question that comes up all the time. Um, do, do we have to have an offer before we apply? You don't have to have an offer. I think often what happens is people make the application uh, to the university and while they're waiting to hear back from the university, they'll apply for the scholarship. It doesn't really matter which order you do it in, whether you apply to us first or the university first, but typically people apply to the university first because they have shorter deadlines there. Um, so yeah, if anybody wondering, don't wait till you hear back from your university. You can definitely apply before that. Yeah, super, super important. Thank you so much for mentioning that. No, no. Um, cool, we'll just leave it there um, and hope that you all enjoy your evenings and wrap up super warm. Did we say it's freezing outside? Um, goodbye, everyone. Thank Ta you, everybody. Thank you.